Hi, everyone, and welcome back to A Criminally Basic Podcast. My name is Megan. And I'm Hannah. And today, I wanted to talk about a case that happened at the very tail end of Hurricane Andrew in 1992. Natural disasters do not prevent heinous acts from taking place. And in fact, they often lead to cases going unsolved since law enforcement is overwhelmed by everything that has to take place when a disaster happens. I've never really thought about heinous crimes taking place, but now that you think of it, you're like, oh, I guess they don't stop for natural disasters. Right. So there are actually cases of people going missing in New York City on 9-11 who had nothing to do with like the towers falling. They weren't close, so they weren't caught up in that tragedy, but their cases weren't worked on until weeks later due to the aftermath of the attack. Yeah. So let's go back to August 27th, 1992, and focus in on Tupelo, Mississippi, where 13-year-old Lee Ochi is being left home alone for the first time. According to a Daily Journal article by William Moore, Lee hadn't started school yet, so she's doing what most teenagers do during the summer, which is sleep in. Yeah, of course. Lee's mom, Vicki Felton, is already up and getting ready for work, and she leaves around 7.35 a.m., knowing that Lee won't be home alone all day. According to the Charlie Project, Lee's grandmother was going to take her to an open house that day, so she wouldn't be by herself for hours and hours. Once Vicky gets into work, she becomes more and more just worried. Even though the hurricane is almost through, there are still some pretty heavy rains and heavy gusts of wind. Lee is terrified of storms, so her mom decides to just call home, you know, check and see if she's doing okay. She calls around 8.30, but she doesn't get a response, which kind of makes her start to worry a little bit. She calls a few minutes later, but again, no answer. Depending on how heavy of a sleeper she was, you can totally justify that because I can sleep through alarms and phone calls. She possibly could have too. Right. No, that's totally true. But at this point, she's called twice and her mom senses kind of start flaring up. You know, Uh, she um, just gets that feeling, you know, that something isn't right. This isn't just her daughter sleeping through the phone. This is maybe something more and she knows how much lee hates storms so her not answering the phone is is enough to kind of make her think something's wrong yeah no that's understandable right so she ends up leaving work and she gets home around nine o'clock that morning so she hasn't been gone very long she's not been gone very long so she arrives And once she does get back to the house, those mom senses start setting off alarm bells because right away she can see that things are not right. The garage door is open and she is 100% sure that she closed it before leaving. And the light is on, which means that it's been activated within the last few minutes. She enters the house and is met with just a mother's worst nightmare. According to missingsippy.org, the back door of the house was found to be unlocked. Even though there wasn't any sign of forced entry, there were blood stains on the walls, carpet, and on the bathroom counter, as well as a trail of blood going from the hallway where Lee's bedroom was to the living room and out the back door. On the doorframe of her room, there was a noticeable amount of blood and some hair, which police would later think meant that Lee had hit her head while possibly fighting off her attacker oh my god so vicky immediately calls 911 when she sees you know the scene before her and police arrive shortly thereafter there they would find even more evidence of a struggle the bra and nightgown that lee had been wearing were found with blood on them and her sleeping bag glasses and some of her undergarments were missing Police also suspected that some effort had been made to clean up the blood in the bathroom because it looked like smeared and kind of diluted, kind of more pink rather than red. But they couldn't find like a rag or a towel or something that had been used to clean up the blood. They just found evidence that a cleanup had been attempted. So possibly who did this could have taken it with them. Most likely, yeah. That's what they think. At first glance, this kind of looks like a routine kidnapping, even though there really isn't a routine kidnapping. Yeah. Stereotypical is... 
Yes. Right, exactly. The blood was later confirmed to be Lee's, but they couldn't tell if it was enough to be deadly. Like they didn't know if it was enough to indicate a homicide or just an injury. Yeah. Because, I mean, you can lose a lot of blood and still be perfectly fine. Right. And especially, like, head wounds specifically bleed a lot. Um, I read somewhere, and I don't remember where I read this, actually, but that if you, like, cut your head or if you cut your hands, they bleed a lot more than other parts of your body just because they're very vascular. Uh Uh-huh. That makes sense, though. Right. I don't quote me on that because not a medical expert, but... But I mean, that would make sense, though, if it was true. Right. According to that same Daily Journal article by William Moore, the blood is still wet. And considering that the light in the garage was on when Vicky got home, police think that she ended up missing the whole event by just minutes. Oh, my God. That's that's wild. No, that is wild. And I mean, I can't I can only imagine how she felt. She could have stopped that, too. Right. And I mean, even if she maybe couldn't have stopped it, at least she would have known, yeah. you know, or, or there would have been a chance. I something I cannot imagine the guilt that comes along with knowing that you were just a few minutes too late. Over the next few days, searchers rallied around the family to help find Lee, but the remnants of Hurricane Andrew posed a really big problem. For one, the police bring in search dogs, but they can't get a hit due to all of the rain and the wind, so that option is just out. At this point, they're a week in, and people, searchers, police, started thinking that they were more likely going to find a body rather than a living, breathing human. Less than a week after Lee went missing, something really just terrifying and horrible and creepy happens lee's glasses were mailed to the house (gasps) are you serious megan Mm -hmm. they were addressed to her stepfather barney yarborough who had actually moved out of the house a few weeks before august 27th following a split from vicky her mom so this tells us two things one someone is taunting this poor family And two, they may know Barney, but since it was mailed to the family home and Barney no longer lived there, we can kind of deduce that they probably weren't close to him, you know, like not close enough to know about the split and the move, just maybe knew him in the past or knew him just in passing, not super close to the family, but familiar with them. Yeah. The glasses and the package that they came in were both sent to the FBI crime lab, hoping to find, you know, some sort of DNA. This is 1992, and even though DNA has progressed significantly farther in these last mm, almost 30 years, you know, they, they were hoping to get something. But whoever took Lee was good at covering up their tracks because the stamps on the envelope were wet with water rather than saliva. So whoever sent them thought ahead basically major ronnie thomas who is the original lead detective on this case said that there was quote more than enough postage on it end quote so the person who sent it must have really wanted to make sure it arrived to the house like there was i think six stamps on it which was significantly more than the person needed so they really wanted to make sure that it made it to its final destination Major Thomas ends up thinking that this was a move to just kind of throw police off. You know, there was no ransom note with it. There was no nothing. It was just the glasses, which, again, kind of makes them think that this isn't a kidnapping for ransom. It's more than likely something much more sinister. Yeah. Not that kidnapping for ransom isn't sinister in and of itself, but... Yeah, that's sinister, but also, like, kidnapping just to murder is a lot worse. Agreed. Yeah, I would rather have an alive child than a not-alive child. Yeah. The glasses were the last major piece of hard evidence in this case. That is, until a year later, when the skeletal remains of a female were discovered in a nearby town. Oh my god. They were positively identified as Lee, but just days later... The police took back their identification. (gasps) They identified the remains as belonging to a 27-year-old woman who had been missing 
not a 13 year old girl okay first off how do you get confused a 27 year old woman and a 13 year old child like so i believe that they were similar heights um and they made the identification based on dental records um and i i did see this kind of contested in a few of my sources some of them said that the um like the, the skeleton that not all of the teeth were there so they made the id based on not having the full set um and then i also saw that they didn't have lee's most updated dental records so yeah. they were making the id off of something that wasn't up to date that makes sense why that happened now yeah but still i mean still sucks right to have everyone going through tor- turmoil just for that right i mean like yes there it was good that this person was found and that another family got closure but it was just tragic someone else's closure too yeah although i mean it would have been a false closure so i mean true true absolutely Ugh. when a person goes missing and we see this in pretty much every case investigators start with the people closest to the victim in this case those people were lee's mom vicky her stepdad barney her biological father, Donald, and her stepmother, Kathy. Her biological father and stepmom were ruled out pretty quickly. Donald was in the military, and he was stationed in Virginia at the time, making his and his wife's alibis pretty airtight. Yeah. Donald would actually say in the weeks following Lee's disappearance that he had an idea of who could really be to blame. His ex-wife, Vicky, and possibly Barney. Lee had reportedly shown up to school with bruises, indicating possible abuse at home, but this was never confirmed. Barney did take and pass a polygraph and was cleared by police, but Vicky, on the other hand, is an entirely different story. Oh. According to the Charlie Project, Vicky was given three polygraphs and failed all of them. What the hell? Yeah, so, and I mean, we, we say all the time, Polygraphs are not an accurate representation of if someone is telling the truth or not. Polygraphs measure stress, and there are a million ways to get false readings on them. As long as I've known that polygraphs aren't the best readers, it's I still haven't got that physically out of my head that they aren't the best readers. No, and I, I totally agree. I think that for me, it's the fact that she took three that are a little... Yeah suspicious i'm kind of yeah. raising my eyebrows at that and like i get it like your kid's missing and there was blood i would understand you being completely stressed right and i mean maybe you know most people don't take polygraphs on a regular basis so if you fail your first one because you're nervous i guess like that that would make sense that doesn't necessarily indicate guilt but after three eh, i'm, I'm kind of there's some questioning to it. I'm not less suspicious. Yeah. Vicky has never been officially named as a person of interest in her daughter's disappearance. Those allegations of abusing Lee fell on her too, but again, those were never really proven, so I really can't say. Did they end up talking to any of Lee's friends or anything to, like, see if, oh, this could be true? They did, um... And I, I can't, I can't quote anything specific. And again, I, th- I think the reason that this is kind of contested a little bit or not really proven is because um, mandatory reporting laws were different because now if a teacher, for instance, um, suspects that there is a child that's being abused, they have to report it. Yeah, you absolutely have to, or you could be fired for that. Right, I mean, it's, it's a big deal. The only other person that could possibly be connected to this case is a man named Oscar Kearns. According to Stories of the Unsolved, Oscar, who went by Mike for some reason. How do you go from Oscar to Mike? I don't know. Maybe it was his middle name. Maybe it was a nickname. I honestly couldn't. (laughs) I tried to find an answer and I couldn't. A little suspicious, but okay. Yeah, I don't know. Um, so Oscar slash Mike went to the same church as Lee and shared her love of horseback riding. While he wasn't immediately scrutinized right after Lee's disappearance, his actions later made people look at him and think that he may have been responsible. 
Nine months after Lee went missing, according to Stories of the Unsolved, Mike abducted a 15-year-old girl and sexually assaulted her. Now, he did let her go, and he was arrested, charged, and sentenced to 24 years with 16 suspended. However, he served... How, Hannah, how much How much do you think he served out of that? It's a 24-year sentence. How much do you think he served? Um, for white male rapist, probably two months. <laughs> he did serve more than two months. Oh, okay. Um, eight. So he served less than four. Of course. Uh-huh. He got out. Was it good behavior? I don't, I actually don't know. I don't know why he got out. Uh, but he did. And then he kidnapped a married couple and sexually assaulted the wife. Pretty much right after he got out. Please tell me they put him in prison for longer and kept him there. They did. So he was caught and charged and sentenced to more prison time. But all of this, these, you know, this kidnapping, the, the kidnapping specifically, especially with the 15-year-old girl, made the community think that he could have been involved in Lee's kidnapping. If he's done it once, he'd probably done it again. Exactly. So, and this could explain why there was no forced entry, right? So Lee probably wouldn't have opened the door to a stranger, but she may have let someone in who she knew from church. Yeah. And it's like, oh, he's from church. He's okay. Exactly. And I mean, like I, I go to church as a church going person. If someone who I recognized from my congregation showed up at my doorstep, I would probably let them in. Yeah, you you don't think twice. I'm not saying if you're a criminal, go to church, but like also. I mean, if you're a criminal, I think you need to go to church. <laughs> I know you do, do you need Jesus. But like, I would open the door for someone I went to church with. Like Exactly. You wouldn't think twice. Based on all I could find, he has not been charged or like officially connected to anything relating to Lee's disappearance. But I think considering his MO, it's not out of the question. Oh, absolutely not. If he did it to a 15-year-old, he would do it to a 13-year-old. Lee Ochi would be 41 at the time of this recording. While the circumstances and the outcome of her abduction still remain unsolved, the Tupelo community still holds out hope that one day this case will be solved and the perpetrator will be brought to justice. Thank you all for listening to A Criminally Basic Podcast. If you want to find out more, find us at A Criminally Basic Podcast on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. And check out our sources as well as photos on our website, www.acriminallybasicpodcast.podbean.com. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next week.